Muy buenos dias, buenas tardes, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I, you know, I don't know when you're watching or listening to this, but welcome. Welcome to Business 123, Introduction to Investments at Southwestern Community College for Spring 2024. Everyone is welcome. You don't have to be enrolled in the class to take our class. It's all free. The textbook is free. The materials are all free. Now, you don't get college credit unless you enroll, but that's up to you. Welcome. My name is Frank Payano, and I introduce myself elsewhere. If you've been nosing around the, the website, you'll see that all the materials, all the presentations, all the handouts, the answer keys, the study guides, the worksheets, commentaries, it's all there. And of course, if you're enrolled in the class, you can get to all this material through Canvas, but all Canvas does is turn around and point to the website, wonderprofessor.com. Welcome, let's get started. This is an introduction to investments class. You need no prior experience, no prior knowledge. In fact, forget everything that you've been told on the telly or the infernal net or your uncle, the self-proclaimed expert on everything, including investments. We start from the very beginning with the question, what is an investment? Okay, cool. So let's, before we do that, take a look at a perspective that you may have heard or read. It is a gloomy moment in history. Never has the future seemed so dark and incalculable. The United States is beset with racial, industrial, and commercial chaos drifting we know not where of our troubles no one can see the end. So, uh, where did you hear this? Where did you see this? Or on Skunk News last night? Um, 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 Badger News? Weasel News? Fo oh, Fox News. Yes. No, no, no. Yeah, I guess the demagogues are in charge. So, oh my God, the world is going to end. Um, if you ask people when you they thought this was written or said, they might say 9-11. They might say 1930s, 1940s. The Great Depression, World War II, it's actually 1847. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, folks, there are always people declaring the end of the world is nigh, and, you know, one of these days they're going to be right, because we know that the world ends. There are several scenarios, one of which, which we know is going to happen, eventually the sun's going to get much, much larger, swallow up, if it doesn't blow up first, which probably won't. It'll swallow up Mercury, swallow up Venus, probably swallow up the Earth. Maybe not. It might stop before then, but before then it'll be too un hot to be bearable to live. But that's not for another billion and a half years, so don't worry about it. In fact, the last 200 years since this was, well, whatever, 180, 150, 80, 70 years or so, have been the most prosperous years in the history of the world. More people as a percentage of the population of, 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 of poor have come out of poverty than ever before. The greatest percentage, actually, they think the greatest percentage was right before the pandemic. So it set us back a few years. Did they have serious problems in the 1840s? Oh yeah, oh yeah. The United States was about ready to tear itself apart with the Civil War. Some ways we're still fighting the Civil War. Do we have serious issues here now in the 2010, 2020s? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. But so far, equating serious with fatal has not been correct. In fact, I'm going to do my best to instill some optimism in you because in my humble opinion, and I'm old, usually as you get old, you get more pessimistic, older you get. Um, I believe the next 20, 30, 40 years are going to be the most prosperous years yet. Assuming we don't blow ourselves up, die in our own way, tsunami, meteorite, earthquake, disco returning, whatever, whatever exogenous offense, uh, events happen, World War III, oh, Mr. Putin, Mr. Xi Jinping, I don't know what's going to happen. But uh, if those things do not come to pass, there are tremendous technologies that are coming down the pike that are going to lift more people out of poverty. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. And what does that mean? That means for us investors, this is an excellent time to be investing. Oh, yeah. No guarantees, <laughs> as we'll say over and over and over again. 
So let's get started with chapter one, introduction, overview, and risk versus return. We've also thrown in short-term investments at the end of the chapter. I don't know, maybe they should be their own chapter, but uh, I just throw them in there. But in this chapter, we're going to introduce you to what an investment is, take a look at the overview of the investment universe, and then encapsulate the whole chapter into one section called the eternal struggle of risk versus return. And Mr. J. Kenfield Morley said it best, in my humble opinion, in the 1880s, I think he did it. In investing money, the amount of interest you want should, be depend, should depend upon whether you want to eat well or sleep well. Now, Mr. Morley used the word interest. I would change the word, if I may be so bold to do so, to reward or return. Because interest is, one, is just one type of, of investment reward. Uh, there are others. So the amount of reward, the amount of return you want should depend upon whether you want to eat well or sleep well. Because <laughs> you can't have it both ways, folks. But, 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 but. In this class, we're going to learn some techniques that should help us eat reasonably well and sleep reasonably well. <laughs> but there are no guarantees. I said that already, didn't I? But relax. The news is good. We're going to see that if we are uh, consistent, prudent, long-term oriented, don't panic, don't get too greedy when things are going really well, don't panic when things are going badly, and the world doesn't end, we should do pretty darn well. I think so. Slide number four. What is an investment? Okay, now this is one definition. There are others, but this is the one we're going to use. An investment is any vehicle into which resources can be placed with the expectation that it will generate positive income or that its value will be preserved or increased or both. This is the definition that we're going to use because it shows that we're interested in cash flow, positive income, but also we're also interested in capital gains or maybe both. This is a definition, this next definition is from Mr. Benjamin Graham. Now we're going to return to him often and we're going to return to this definition often. He was Warren Buffett's teacher. You might have, of course, you might have heard of Mr. Warren Buffett, very famous investor. An investment operation is one which, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and a satisfactory return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative. So we're going to do our best to uh, differentiate between someone who's an investor and someone who's a speculator. Another word for that is trader. Uh, trader. T-R-A-D-E-R. -E and we're hoping you want to be an investor. Because if you want to be a speculator, <laughs> you're up against the best in the business. And you know what? We really can't help you. I mean, I can point you, we can point you in the right direction and hope that you do well, but it's not easy. It's not easy. But being an investor... Ah. In fact, Mr. Warren Buffett says investing is simple, but it ain't easy. Wait a minute. <laughs> what does he mean? What we're going to find in this class is that the intellectual part of investing is actually pretty simple. I mean, we're going to look, we're going to go through the, the various types of investments. We're going to see what kind of returns we can expect from them and um, what kind of risks we're going to take to get those returns. And see that the news is good if we have a long-term perspective. It's the emotional part. That's the ain't easy part. That's the part that's going to get us. Because our emotions take hold and can make us do things that are really, really bad for long-term prudent investors. Okay? So you're going to see that investing is pretty simple, but it ain't easy. <laughs> now... Remember Mr. Kenfield Morley said uh, investment, he said he used the word interest. But investment returns come in many different flavors. There's different, it definitely interest from certain types of investments, but that's, um, that's not the only type of income we can get, the cash flow we can get. We can also get dividends, which are similar to interest payments, but a little different, and then rent from real estate. 
we call these cash flows, okay? Cash flows. Um, and then the other side of the coin, the one that most people key on when they, especially when they think of, uh, of uh, speculative investments, is the uh, capital appreciation, capital gains, right? Increased value. Yippee, my stock went up or my real estate investment went up. Capital losses are also on the table because <laughs> sometimes investment go down in price and those are called capital losses and boo, we don't like those it's, well, you know part of investing especially if you want better returns is dealing with the capital losses dealing with the emotions that come with losing money in the short term because in the long term if the world doesn't end we keep growing the economy and getting more and more people we got a long way to go sometimes some people will say well you can't grow forever and I say, well, you're right. We can't grow forever. I mean, that's obviously uh, the only uh, strategy employed by that are cancer cells, right? But we have a long way to go before everyone has uh, good food, healthy food, uh, decent shelter, clothing, and, of course, Internet access. Investments come in all shapes, flavors, and sizes. And so what we're going to do in this presentation get out a sheet of paper or, you know, print out the, the study guide, is we're just going to look at the aspects, some of the characteristics of various investments. And then in the next presentation, we'll get a little closer and take a little closer, not too close, you know, we're going to be looking at the forest, not the trees, of the various investment alternatives. So, uh, uh, again, get a little uh, piece of paper out if you want to take notes or get that uh, print out that study guide so you can you know, mark that study guide up. There are three major types of investments, securities, properties, and personal investments. Now, I really do not like this term, securities, because uh, then people think, what? I'm not an administrative administration of justice major. I don't need, no, 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 not that type of security. The securities are investments that represent debt or ownership. They are I like to tell people, even though they're, they're it's a little bit more complicated than that, but they're financial investments. Or they represent lending money to somebody, debt, or owning something, or the legal right to acquire or sell an ownership interest. What? What, the, what does that mean? Ignore that for now, okay? Because that's the tricky, uh, uh, what are called derivatives. And they're just, oh, they're just, they're, they're, first of all, you want to stay away from them. But they're, they're, they're still securities in that they can be traded. They can be sold and purchased to other investors. So when you hear the word securities, you can just think of them as financial investments. In this class, we're going to deal with stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Those are the major securities in our, oh, and short-term investments also in our class. There are many others. Property. Real property. Oh, what a silly name. Real estate. Why is it called real? Because it's either land or attached to the land. That's the legal term, right? And then personal property. Precious metals, gold, art, automobiles, beanie babies, collectibles. Art is often uh, touted as the most lucrative investment. Yeah, for 0.0001% of the art out there not for us. And and cars, some people actually do very well with cars, but they're normally depreciated depreciable as, as assets. They they do they go down in value, but some go up in value. And then gold, we'll spoke, talk about gold later on. Uh you might have, might have also heard of commodities, and that's a that's a whole world unto itself, part of um part of the, the world. In other words, uh investing in wheat or corn or or, or, or uh, metals, you know, so yeah, later, later, later. Now, the third type of investment we're not going to spend any time on except for today, and that's personal investment, which are often considered the best investment. In fact, none other than Benjamin Franklin said that education is the best investment somebody can make. And you are doing that right now by taking this class. You are investing in yourself. And we often say that college is often the best investment a person will ever make. I certainly believe it was for me. It doesn't mean it is for everyone, especially if you get come out of college with $180,000 worth of student loan debts. But uh, <clears throat> that's why we love Southwestern, isn't it? But uh, yes, travel, broadening your horizons, 
um, and uh, learning, uh, increasing your earning power, just increasing you as a as a as a as a citizen. Yeah, I I think so. I I I, I believe education is the most important asset. But in our class, we concentrate on securities. We're going to spend most of our time on securities. We'll spend a little bit of time at the end of the semester on uh, on uh, real estate, gold, precious metals, art, collectibles, mm, crypto, cryptocurrencies. Uh, cryptocurrencies. Mm. So, so slide number six. What are the different types of assets? There are primary assets, and then there are derivatives. In the primary asset class, they boil down to two major categories. Debt, where you lend your money to somebody else, typically for interest income and a promise to repay the loan at some future date. These are bonds, and we'll talk about bonds in detail later on. Short-term investments such as savings accounts. Yeah, you don't think of it that way. When, but when you go to the bank, you're actually lending your money to the bank and they're promising to pay you interest. And actually, after many years of paying you basically nothing, they're finally paying us something now. The other type where the action is are equities. Ownership in a business or maybe property, right? And the examples of these are stocks. I hate that term, stocks. You're buying a business. Well, there's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo behind all this stuff. And you're actually buying shares in a corporation, a corporate entity, and yeah, but just think of it as a business. In fact, none of them, Warren Buffett says, forget about stocks, go out and buy a business. And he means buy the stock, buy the business via the stock. Partnerships, sole proprietorships. Some of you are going to take Business 120, Introduction to Business. You're going to learn more about the legal frameworks. If you take Business 140, you'll learn even more. And then real estate, ownership in real estate, or if you don't want to buy a, and be a landlord, you can buy real estate through what are called real estate investment trusts, REITs, which are actually pretty cool, and we'll take a look at them later on down the line. The other type of asset are derivative assets. These are securities that derive their value from an underlying security or asset. Huh? They're not the asset? No, they point to some other asset. They derive their value from another asset. These are things, that you stay away from these things, folks. You're going to see some people trying to convince you that you can make a million dollars overnight with these things. And you know what? You could, or you can lose a million dollars overnight with these things. And the, op the, the, uh, the biggest examples are options and futures, but there are many others. So this is all you need to know about derivatives this, <laughs> in this chapter. That's all, is that they derive their value from some other asset, and they're highly speculative, and the two big examples are options and futures. Actually, the name is options contracts and futures contracts, but try saying that three times fast. It's not easy. Some in the industry do not classify derivatives as investments. I am certainly one of them. I do my best to dissuade friends, family, <laughs> students, <laughs> anybody who will listen to stay away from these things. But if you like to go to Las Vegas, uh, they're gambling, folks. But we don't, oh, no, no, we don't use that term in the investment industry. Oh, no, 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 no. We say speculative. And the, uh, it's a fancy way of saying gambling, all right? So if you hear the word speculation, you substitute the word gamble, all right? Good. Slide number seven. Investments also come in two flavors in, with regard to whether they are direct investments or indirect investments. Direct investments, you're in control. Your name is on the account. Your name is on the, the title. You can buy and sell as you wish. Indirect investments are investments where somebody else is actually doing the investing. They're investing on your behalf. You have limited control. Actually, you mostly have no control over the underlying investment. And these are mutual funds, real estate investment trusts, limited partnerships. Yeah, people get confused. You can buy or sell your shares of the mutual fund or the REIT, but the mutual fund is actually doing the investment for you. The real estate investment trust is investing in the properties for you. So that's why we call them indirect investments. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay, so don't call up your mutual fund and say, hey, I think you ought to buy Apple. <laughs> Excuse us. We're doing our research. We're 
We're, we'll decide. Slide number eight. Now, here's a little tricky, a little curveball that you must learn because you're going to be the investment gurus for your friends, family, and coworkers, and you can't let them down. Investments are categorized about according to their domesticity, which is a fancy word for saying where do they get their mail, where is the headquarters, where, is the, where are they based, what country. Now, it would make sense that there be two, right? Domestic and foreign, or domestic and international, or global. No, 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 three categories. Domestic categories are based inside the United States, whereas international, sometimes called foreign, sometimes called overseas, are based outside the United States. And global means both domestic and international. So be very careful of this subtle distinction. If you see uh, in your 401k a global fund and you see an international fund, you might think there's no difference between the two, but there is. The global fund can invest anywhere, todo el mundo, <laughs> all over the world, whereas the international fund is not going to invest in the United States. Now, there's a historical reason why this came about. Um, in the, you know, before the 1970s or so, people just did not invest outside the United States. They, they, in the United States, we invested in the United States. But then people wanted to get more foreign exposure. So this new category called international came about. And at the same time, global came about saying, you know, we want to invest everywhere. The world is a very small place these days economically. A very smart manager, mutual fund manager who's since retired said, and this is from Forbes. 65% eh? of buy value of the parts in the Ford Mustang come from the United States and Canada. 90% of the parts in the Toyota Sienna, which is built in Indiana, by the way, come from the U.S. and Canada, which is the more American car. How can you get more American than a Ford Mustang? Buy a Toyota Sienna. <laughs> Folks, <clears throat> there are some companies based in the United States, that many companies, many of the companies you know, that, that we know of, that, that the brand names, household names, make more money outside the United States. Coca-Cola, right? The, the second most uh, well-known word all around the world. Coca-Cola. What's the first? Okay. <laughs> okay. And it's such a great word, isn't it? Okay. Um, it's based in Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. So yeah, it's a United States company. But they make 80% of their money outside the United States. So if every United Stater decided they were no longer going to buy Coca-Cola and drink fizzy sugar water with a brown crayon dipped in it, it would still be a major multinational corporation. In fact, there are companies that are based outside the United States that do most of their business inside the United States. And there's one company based in the United States that doesn't do any business in the United States. Figure that one out. It's called Philip Morris International. That's the company that sells the Marlboros and the Virginia Dims, uh, Slims outside the United States. So the world is a very small place these days economically. And before the pandemic, this was generally considered a great thing by econo econ economists and businesses because they just thought of it as one big uh, market and they could move stuff around the world easily and then the Buyers had other ideas, and so now you hear about nearshoring and smart shoring, or whatever the buzz term is, and trying to get um, more localization of their of their uh, manufacturing and distribution and the like. But hey, we like to think we're in control of the world, right? Now the viruses say, "Ha!" ha, ha. <laughs> Slide number nine. So, thinking of domestic and foreign. We want you to take a look at these companies, right? In a face-to-face -face class, we just ask people to call out, you know, but which of these are domestic, which of these are foreign, right? What do you think, huh? What do you think is domestic? Well, maybe Budweiser 7-Eleven, Trader Joe's, Ben & Jerry's. And who's foreign? Well, you know, maybe Seagram's, Bayer, Bayer Aspirin. I don't know. Is uh, Shell Oil foreign? I don't know. Anyway. anyway, let's go through the list. Budweiser. Mother Bud, right? It's actually a foreign company, right? <laughs> well, it was purchased back, what, 2008 or 9 by a Be Belgian-Brazilian uh, consortium of uh, beverage companies. So even though they now call themselves Anheuser-Busch Ambev, they, they, have an, they, they snuck the Anheuser into the name Imbev, but it's based outside the United States. Shell Oil. 
Well, you know, the real, even though they they are a huge presence in, in the United States, it's actually based in the UK and the Netherlands, Royal Dutch Petroleum. It's a company that's been around for over 100 and whatever many years. Uh, ben and Jerry's, well, yeah, they started out in Vermont, but now they're owned by Unilever in the United Kingdom. Farmers Insurance is now owned by a Swiss company. Arco is owned by British Petroleum. Gerber is a foreign company. Firestone is Japanese. Cup of Soup is also owned by Unilever. Fox News. Oh, my goodness. If you don't believe Fox News, then you is not an American, and it's actually based in Australia. But, again, it, these all these companies are basically global companies. Now, Seagram's. Many of you would know that Seagram's was a Canadian company, right? Was. Was. It's been broken up and... Now it's all out. It's in various parts of the world. Bayer Aspirin it started in Germany. Vaseline is the UK. Friskies is now owned by a Swiss company. Uh, I think it's um, Nestle, right? Nestle. Trader Joe's is owned by Aldi. Aldi, the German um, grocery store outlet. 7-Eleven. Now, there's a real interesting business story. And one of the cool things about it, about investing, in my humble opinion, especially in stocks, obviously businesses, is the stories behind these companies. 7-Eleven started in uh, in in, in um, Texas, right? And then they moved around the world and they opened up a subsidiary, 7-Eleven of Japan, in Japan. It turns out the Japanese love small stores. They just love them. And that's where you get everything at the small stores. You know, we like big, right? Like big, United States like big. But 7-Eleven Japan became so profitable and so so successful, they turned around and bought the United States 7-Eleven. And now I don't know how many how many people you go down to Mexico, how many of you go down to Mexico, but the Mexicans love small stores. There are OXOs everywhere. And 7-Eleven is kind of saying, well, you know me some too. <laughs> so now you go down to Mexico and there are 7-Elevens popping up everywhere. Pretty cool. Look it up. You know, in fact, if any of you have the idea that you want to be a business person and have your own business, uh, franchising is not a bad choice, folks. It's not a bad, not not necessarily a great choice, especially if it's not a very good franchise like Subway. But uh, but Seven Eleven is one of the better choices for um, franchising, in my humble opinion. Not that I own one or anything, but I'm, I'm not making any money. I'm not getting any kickback or anything. But they really do their best to make to help their franchisees be successful. So keep that in mind. But you got to keep that store open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So remember that too. He might get a call in the middle of the night that the the guy, the overnight guy, is throwing up and has to go home, and you have to go up there. Anyway, anyway. what about Volvo and Saab? Oh, right, definitely foreign. No, for 20 some odd years. Volvo was owned by Ford and Saab was owned by GM, but now they're foreign again. Volvo is now owned by Geely, is it? Or Geely, it's a Chinese firm, and Saab is owned by some small Netherlands company. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bit of an eye-opener, isn't it? I think it is. Um, the world is global, for good or ill. You know, for sometimes it's ill with regard to the, uh, to the uh, pandemic, and sometimes it's ill with regard to rogue states like russia many companies are trying to leave russia russia doesn't want them to leave and is making it very difficult many have already gotten out but oh my goodness but um but it's also good because why we want everyone to succeed we want everyone to have food clothing and shelter and internet access and that why not because we're some liberal no 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 it's because we want to make money <laughs> Because when people have more, they're not living hand to mouth, there's more money in their pockets. What do they want? They want diapers and they want cigarettes and they want alcohol and they want Star Wars. They want television and they want, and they want bicycles and, and cell phones and cars. And, and that means investment. companies are going to do well and we as investments are going to, I know it sounds like a commercial from the 1950s, my apologies, but I'm actually very, very... Um, positive, uh, optimistic about the future. If we don't blow ourselves up, World War III. And check out this uh, really it's a cool little website called Visual Capitalist. Check out this visual representation of the world economy. You know, people are so angry in the United States that China is going to overtake us as a, as a global, as, a, as the largest economy. 
folks, they got four times more people than we do. Of course, you know, if they modernize, which they have, and then people want the things that we want, that we have, and we've had for over 100 years, and we're almost, uh, then of course their, their economy is going to get bigger. And if India gets their act together, which they didn't, they, some things are going well, some things, uh, they'll overtake China eventually. <laughs> so uh, that's the world. And then Africa is, you check out Africa. Africa is booming. Eventually, Africa, it's hard to believe, but eventually Africa is supposed to be the largest continent with regard to, to population. I mean, it's not for 50, 100 years from now, folks, but that's what's, if the demographic, meaning study of populations, if the demographic trends continue, that's what's going to happen. While the uh, other countries that are now the biggest are going to get smaller, we're going to lose people. Check it out. Domestic or foreign? Global. Now, speaking of uh, global investing, these are the top 18 countries according to per capita income in alphabetical order, which have had the best average annual return over the past 50 years. Now, I, the place I was getting this data from is no longer there. I can't find it. So this goes back to, I think, 2018 or so, or 2017. So my apologies. But which do you think would have the best average annual return over the past 50 years? And of course, in the face-to-face -face class, we would ask, ask people to, to jump up and down and scream and holler and who do they think is going to be the best, right? It's not the USA. Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands. Wait a minute, Northern European news socialists. <laughs> they believe in, in uh, 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 socialized medicine. They, they believe that their students shouldn't have to come out of college with $180,000 worth of student loan debt. How could they do? Well, they're capitalists, folks. You know, they believe in capitalism. But also, what's going on down here in Italy, Austria, Spain? Why aren't they doing well? Again, demographics. Demographics, right. Um, the, um, the Italy, if you go to Italy, they'll sell you a house for a, a dollar. Well, it's a euro, so a dollar twenty or something like that. Of course, it's going to cost you ten, twenty thousand dollars to fix it up because it's been abandoned. But uh, they'll, they they want they want you to have babies, right? See, oh, twenty twenty one. Okay, so I gotta I gotta update this. I gotta find I gotta find the data. This is where I got it from, but I I got it mostly from this guy right here, the Global Economy, and I, I can't find it anymore. So if anybody's really good at uh, data research, which I'm not very good at, uh, you know, and you'll you'll get twice. I'll pay you twice with their. Well, no, I can't pay you twice. <laughs> just uh, it, it's um, it's a labor of love. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, so we're going to come back to this. So don't worry, folks. Don't worry. The USA is no slouch. The USA is not a slouch. If we get 10.7% over the next 50 years, we're going to be very, very happy. And should we invest all our money in Sweden? Well, not necessarily. Hang on a minute. We'll come back to this guy. Right, stick with us. Slide number 11. We also have to think in terms of our time horizon. Very important. In fact, it's probably the most important aspect we have to think of when we want to decide whether we're going to invest. Because there are some things that we just can't invest in if our time horizon is very short, like stocks or real estate, because they're just too darn volatile, they're too darn risky in the short term. So these are the general guidelines used throughout the industry. I tend to use these, the ones here, the, the ones at the bottom, which are more used in the life insurance industry, but in the financial services, the investment services industry, usually you'll see short term is up to a year or so. Intermediate term, two, three, four, maybe five years. Long term investments are generally considered five or more years, 10, 20, 30 years. I tend to take a little longer view, one or two years, maybe even three years for short term. Intermediate term, three, five, six, seven. How long does it take to put together a down payment on a house? It can take up to six or seven years. And then long term, seven years, 10, 20, 30 years. Before you make an investment, you must know your time horizon. So you decide which ones you're going to use. Uh, probably you'll want to use the, the, the general ones used in the financial investment services industries. And you might want to use these, which are the life more more you'll see more in the life insurance industry, and that's the they're the ones I tend to think of. But everyone's different, right? You decide. Slide number twelve. 
Investments are also categorized to about whether they are liquid or illiquid investments. And uh, has nothing to do with how much beer we have for the weekend, folks. No, 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 no. It has to do with whether or not our investments can easily and quickly be converted into cash. There is a ready market to purchase the investment. Change of ownership happens quickly. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, REITs, boom. You go online, call your broker, boom, it's gone. You get the money with stocks and REITs in two days, bonds and mutual funds in one day. Get the money back right away. Whereas illiquid investments may be difficult to convert into cash. The market for the investment is small or the change of ownership happens slowly or both. And the poster child for an illiquid investment is real estate. You just can't sell your house and get the money the next day. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> it can take, you know, three months, six months, sometimes longer. Uh, sometimes, you know, when real estate's uh, changing hands very quickly, you might be 30 days, but that's you know, unusual. Some places will say, oh yeah, we'll pay cash, no problem, they'll get your money in 10 days, and they'll pay you $200,000 less than what the house is worth. So be very careful about these sharks out there. And they have a lot of cash available, and they're, they're very happy to, to take your money. We're paying you. No, 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 you're screwing. <laughs> you're, but they're out there, they're out there. So remember, illiquid, think of real estate. It uh, doesn't mean it's not a very good investment, but it just, you have to remember, it's, it might take a while for you to get your money. Partnerships are sometimes the same way. Sometimes it's difficult to tell you you're, you're part of the partnership. And collectibles, well, you know, people, have you, have you ever known anybody who's actually sold a diamond at a profit? You have a Beanie Baby collection or a baseball car collection. Is it really worth what they say it is on the internet? Yeah, that's what they'll sell it to you for. But when you try to sell it back to them, they'll give you, you know, 60% or 50% of what they will sell it to you. So be careful about liquidity. And slide 413. Here it is, folks. The entire <laughs> semester in one slide. Risk versus return. Do you want to eat well or do you want to sleep well? Well, in the investment community, we use the term risk differently than, than uh, what most of us think of risk. When we think of risk, we think the, of the possibility of suffering harm or loss or danger. But in, reality, in, in the investment world, it's a little different. Risk is the chance that actual investment returns will differ from your expected returns. So in other words, you expected to get 8% or 10% out of this investment. You only got 4%, all right? In general, the higher the expectation of investment returns, rewards, interest, dividends, capital gains, the higher the risk level. And there's no way to get around this, folks. There's just no way. And anybody who tells you differently is lying. <laughs> We're going to look at this in detail in the third presentation of Chapter 1. Low risk, 3 to 5%, sometimes a little less. Moderate risk, risk 5 to 8. High risk, in my humble opinion, anything above 8, 9, 10%. It's pretty high risk. Other people might put it at 10, 11, 12%. Anything greater than 12%, in my humble opinion, is considered speculative. And we remember what we, yeah, right. If it's speculative, that means it's gambling. And, and many investors, many in, in, in professionals and, 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 and lay people alike will not consider speculation investing. I certainly don't. Now, you might come across others Others saying, ah, no, Payana is too darn conservative. Don't worry about him. Uh, don't listen to him. Uh, we're going to shoot for 15%. And in which case, I wish them a lot of luck, you know. Uh, uh, they're going to need it. <laughs> There's a wonderful group that we'll discuss later on in, in, the, class, in the class called the Better Investing. Betterinvesting.org. Check out their website. Um, we have a, in the appendix of the book, we discuss the, uh, their stock selection guide. Their motto is they're shooting for 15%. And I ask different individuals who, who use their tools, I say, do you really get 15%? One group did. They were doing over 50. They were doing 16%. But most of them say, yeah, about the 10, 11, 12%. And I think, okay, great. God bless you. You get 10, 11, 12%, you're, you're doing great. 
So, but 15 is, it's tough, folks. It's very, very tough. So now, now that you have all that under your belt, and we want you to make sure you do, <laughs> we want you to go through that information over and over and over again. Uh, and that's all you have to know for now. That's all you have to know for, for so far. You don't have to worry about the debt, what an actual stock is or a mutual fund. No, no. All you have to know is what are the aspects that we're discussing in this chapter so far. Let's take a look at some, some example investments. If we go to Bank of America and we put money in a savings account, is that a security or is it property? Well, you know, we don't like that term security, but yeah, that's what it is. You're lending your money. So it represents debt. It's not an equity. It's not an ownership position in Bank of America. You're not buying their shares in their, in their company. Is it direct or indirect? Well, your name will be on the registration. That's what it's called, registration. It'll be on the name of the, the savings account when you get your statement. And so it is a direct investment. Is it domestic or foreign? So where is Bank of America based? Well, it used to be based in San Francisco. Now it's in North Carolina, right? Charlotte? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so it's domestic. Is it short-term, intermediate-term, or long-term? Well, now, you know, we're going to see that savings accounts and, and other types of short-term investments are meant to be short-term. But some people will keep them for the longer term, excuse me, <coughs> longer term, intermediate term. But what we're going to find is if you have a long-term perspective, keeping your money in a savings account is usually not the best choice. It's certainly the safest choice, but it's not the best choice for maximizing your long-term investment potential. How's that for <laughs> investment speak? In other words, you could do a whole lot better by investing in prudent, long-term oriented investments that should give you a better return than savings accounts. Risk, yes, very, very low. In fact, if you put your money in a savings account in a um, US bank or a credit union, you're basically having your money guaranteed uh, by the federal government. It's actually an insurance program that, that, that protects it. And we'll discuss that at the end of this chapter. Uh, is it liquid or illiquid? It's very liquid, right? You go to the bank and say, I want my money. Now, if you have $77,000 in your account and you say, I want my money in cash, they're going to look at you funny and say, well, we'll give you a cashier's check, but we don't have $77,000 <laughs> in the bank right now, sir. Do you want to come back tomorrow? And you say, okay, I want my money in cash. And then you'll leave and come back tomorrow and they will have called the IRS, the, not the IRS, they'll call the FBI and say, and submit a suspicious transaction. <laughs> it's part of the Patriot Act. Okay. <laughs> Didn't remember that, folks. Uh, look it up if you don't believe me. Patriot Act, suspicious transactions. And they're not allowed to tell you, by the way. They're not allowed to say who we're going to call you, call the FBI. Nestle's Foods. Nanny -E S-T-L-E-S. None of you remember that unless you're old like me. Security or property? Well, it's a corporation. It's a it's a company. It's a it's a stock, right? We buy the 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 company. We buy the corporation through shares of stock, so it's a security. It's equity. It's ownership in the company. Yes, I own part of the company. My one share of Nestle. Direct or indirect? Well, it's direct because on the brokerage account, your name will be on the registration, which means the shares are in your name. Domestic or foreign? Hmm. It's foreign. It's based in Switzerland. It's the world's largest food company. But in reality, folks, Nestle is a, is a country unto itself. It's a company which is a country unto itself. It is everywhere. No matter where you go in this world, well, I think maybe, I don't know if it's in North Korea, but you're going to find Nestle Foods. And I don't know if they're trying to sneak their way out of Russia. They might be trying to do that now, but I doubt it. Short term, intermediate term, or long term? Well, in general, stocks should be considered long term. So we'd want to think about our investment for the long term. But a company like Nestle, the world's largest food manufacturer, you could do intermediate term. Don't do stocks short term, folks. It's very dangerous. They could drop 20% in one month, one week, one day. Not fun. Low, moderate, or high risk? Normally, stocks are considered high risk. But it's Nestle, so moderate. Yeah, I think I'd say moderate. Liquid or illiquid? Yeah, somebody wants to buy your shares of Nestle if you want to sell them, and you're going to get your money the next, well, two days. Stocks uh, settle. Settlement is in two days. 
And you say, well, what do you mean? I don't get my money for two days? Yeah, yeah don't worry. Your, your brokerage firm will usually front you the money if, 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 you, uh, if you really need it that day. They'll say, you, you can't wait two days? All right, well, we'll, we'll they'll, 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 they'll actually, what they'll do is they'll loan you the money because they know the money's coming. And they may charge you interest. They may not. It depends on how good a customer you are. Southwestern College Proposition AA and R bonds. And what are these things? What are these things? What are bonds? They're loans. They're like mortgages. Folks, have you been on the combat campus lately? They're still doing lots of redestruct, uh, re reconstruction. I mean, that, that beautiful stadium, we didn't have a bake sale to build that stadium, folks. No, no, it doesn't work that way. We had to make loans. And the, we don't go to a bank. We don't go to a credit union. We go to the investment community and say, hey, we're Southwestern Community College. Will you lend us $90 million or $500 million, however much it was. And the investment community looks at us and says, mm, all right. So is it a security or property? It is a security. Those loans are securities, which means that if you own those bonds, you could turn around and sell them to another investor or buy them from another investor. Are they debt or equity? No, you're not owning a piece of Southwestern Community College, folks. No, 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 no. You're owning the debt. You're owning our loan. Eh, kind of silly, isn't it? You're getting to play the part of the bank in that you get to own the loan and get paid the interest. And don't, don't worry, we're going to pay you back all that principal eventually. Is it direct or indirect? Well, it will be direct on the brokerage firm. I mean, it used to be you could have these bonds in your hand. They used to be documents, uh, but not anymore. It's all electronic. But on the account, your name is on the account. You are the direct owner of these assets. Now, some mutual funds might own our bonds. And if you own the mutual fund, that would be an indirect investment. Domestic or foreign? No, some people call us Tijuana Tech, but there is an Instituto Tecnologico de Tijuana, folks. So, no, we're not, we're, we're, <laughs> we're Chula Vista, we're domestic. Short term, intermediate term, or long term? Well, in general, people buy their bonds for the long term. Some, there's some ways you can make bonds short term, intermediate term especially depending on when they mature. But uh, usually people buy them for the long term and, and live off the interest. Low, moderate, or high risk? They're fairly low. They're based on the property taxes of the houses and, and commercial properties in the South Bay, uh, Southwestern Community College School District or College District. And for the most part, people pay their property taxes. Right? There are times, 2008-9, when people believed that no property taxes would be paid, and it was a very scary time. So they became more high risk, but no, they're moderate, moderate low. Uh, the investment community likes us. <laughs> liquid or illiquid? Very liquid. Yes, somebody is going to want to buy your Southwestern Community College uh, uh, bonds if you so want to sell them. And then bonds, you get your money the next day. <laughs> Stocks takes two days. How about a duplex in Spring Valley? You, Valley? you rent one, you live in the other. Is that a secure? Yes, it's property, real estate. It's attached to the ground. Debt or equity? You own it. Right. It's equity. It's ownership. Direct or indirect? Well, your name is on the title down at the uh, county admin, admin building. Now, some people try to hide the ownership by creating these entities and trusts and the like. But eventually, they have to be able to identify who is the owner. So sometimes it takes a while, but they'll figure out who's the owner. Is it domestic or foreign? Well, so it's Spring Valley, it's domestic. Short term, intermediate term, or long term? Well, in general, in my humble opinion, um, real estate should be considered a long term investment. Now, there have been times when real estate has just been exploding and people were bought, flipping, so to speak, houses. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, I like to think of real estate as a long-term investment. And for those investors who take a long, have taken a long-term perspective with real estate, they have done very, very well. How about whether it's low, moderate, or high risk? Well, <clears throat> in general, real estate could be considered moderate, but at times it's been very high risk, uh, especially when, when prices just keep going up and up and up and everyone thinks, hey, there's no way and it's, property values are ever going to, Fall. In 2006, 2007, my buddy, who's a much more aggressive investor than I am, 
said, oh, real estate's going to fall 50%. I said, Jim, you, know, you got to go back to the Great Depression to see real estate fall that far. I thought it was going to be at 20, 25%. He was right. <laughs> we didn't call it the Great Depression too. We called it the Great Recession. But a lot of people lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Banks lost hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah. But no, in general, moderate. Liquid or illiquid? Again, real estate is the poster child for a ill for an illiquid investment, meaning that it's not you're not going to get your money overnight. It's going to take you know three, six, nine months. And, but it's not like real estate in San Diego has done poorly, except for those times when it has done poorly when people overbought. <sighs> Qualcomm Corporation. First, it's supposed to be all uppercase. And it used to be a stadium, but not anymore. I I don't like typing it out as all uppercase. It looks really bad. But that's the way they do it. What are they? Anyway, what do they do? They make chips? No, they don't make chips. They design chips and somebody else makes them for them. And they created a system called CDMA, which is one of the two major systems for cell phones. CDMA, CDMA stood for can't do much of anything. No, code division multiple access. But that there's two. The, the other one was GSM, which was developed by Nokia. And they've merged and they're, it's, all, it's all different now. But, but they're making most of their money now off of chips that go into mobile devices. Because they've, they've been doing this forever. And um, they're based here in San Diego, right? But they make more money outside the United States than they do inside the United States. So figure that one out. It's a security. It's a stock. It's equity ownership. Direct investment. Your name is on the registration of the brokerage account. Domestic, yes, it's based here in San Diego, but right, <laughs> they make more money outside the United States. Stocks in general, in my humble opinion, should be considered a sh long-term investment, although some people will treat them like short-term or intermediate-term investments, and to them we wish great success and great luck because they're going to need it. Low, moderate, or high risk? Well, technology in general is pretty high risk, folks. Uh, what's happening with Qualcomm? Well, Google and Apple and who else are now designing their own chips that are going to go into their products. But still, still many, many people, Samsung, still many people use the Qualcomm chips. Liquid or illiquid? In general, they're very liquid. Why? Because uh, people are interested in Qualcomm. So your stocks... You'll be able to sell your stocks pretty pretty straightforwardly uh, without any problems. Now, what about a loan to Uncle Harry? Uh, right. Every family has an Uncle Harry. Tio Lucas. And good for... I mean, good, I got good for... Maybe he makes good uh, barbecue, whatever. Uh, you made a loan to Uncle Harry. Is it security or property? Well, it's a security. It's a uh, debt because it's a loan. He's supposed to be paying you interest and paying the money back, but hasn't made a payment in several months. It's direct. You're the one who owns it. It's domestic until he sends you a postcard from Puerto Rico or some, well, that's still part of the United States, but whatever. Short term, intermediate term, long term, or forever. Are you ever going to get paid back? I don't know. Low, moderate, or high risk? Infinitesimally high risk? And is it liquid or illiquid? Nobody's going to want to Take over your loan. Yeah, would you take over this loan for Uncle Harry? They'll all look at you and say, oh, you're such a great guy for taking care of Uncle Harry, who's now giving you the business. I mean, get taking care of you. So, go back over this. Welcome to our class. Remember, this is all you need to know for now. Don't worry about all the other stuff that you've heard about. We're going to get into that in detail. I like to think of this class as like an onion. We start peeling away the layers, and then we'll get to the core. Don't worry, folks. And you, you are going to be an investment guru, an official card-carrying investment guru. We are so proud of you. Thank you so much for being in our class. We are very happy you are here with us. Remember, we want this to be the best class you have ever taken. I know it's a bit over the top, but it is sincere. See you in our next presentation where we will look at the overview of the investment universe.